This is the Compass Podcast, where we give you a glimpse of the divine in the everyday. I'm Ryan Dunn. I'm Pierce Drake. Thank you so much for joining us on this edition of the Compass Podcast, which is a fun one. We're joined by a guy named Jerry Herships. He's the founder of After Hours in Denver. It's a thriving community that meets in bars and pubs. And Jerry is originally a comedian and a bartender, but he's drawn into ministry after he realized that the connections and conversations he was having with his customers at the bar were deeper and more real than anything he'd experienced in church. And so he has set out to put together communities that provide that same kind of connection to each other and to the divine as well. Yeah, well, we had an incredible podcast today and a lot of laughs, a lot of off-air fun. And <laughs> and then you're going to hear a little something different. You're going to hear it just stop. <laughs> and we don't really know why that happened today. Um, but for whatever reason, the recorder stopped. So we pick right back up as best we could in the moment. I think we went like 40 minutes after it stopped. Yeah. And so uh, so a lot of fun. That's how that's how into it we were, how much uh, Jerry just drops knowledge after knowledge and and uh, some great points. And so, hey, it's got a fun, fun stop in the middle of it today, but you're going to hear some incredible truths and some incredible wisdom and things to think about. And so here we go. Jerry Herships is with us. Jerry, thanks so much for joining us. How's it going? Thanks for having me on. Good. It is uh, wet and cloudy here in Denver, but besides that, everything else is good. Yeah. Cool. Well, we want to throw on like the journalistic gloves to start this thing off because I read your book, Rogue Saints. It's wonderful. Uh, within the book, you know, you're just a little bit critical of some of the ways that that church is organized or the ways that um, we execute church. That was passive so, aggressive, right? <laughs> that was very <laughs> passive aggressive. My, my name wasn't mentioned anywhere, so I'm, I'm all good with it. But um, Piers and I have answered this question in past episodes. Go back to episode one. But Jerry, why are you a part of church? That's an excellent question. Uh, and when you say you, you mean me personally, why did I decide not to chuck the whole thing? And yeah. Uh-huh. Why yeah. do you do what you do on, well, when your community gets together? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think um, one of the, one of the challenges with uh, after hours getting together is, is we, we really have one guiding question that we ask and we've asked it from the beginning. And that is we, we hold everything up to the mirror that says, is this thing that we're about to do or any piece of this thing we're about to do uh, going to make us or lead us towards being more like Christ? Like for us, it is, and I grew up, and people have heard this before, and I wrote this in the book, you know, I grew up Catholic, and I'm actually very down with uh, ritual and liturgy, and, and I grew up with that and did Mass six days a week and was pretty hardcore Irish Catholic Belfast grandmother guy and and I didn't know any different or any better and so that became sort of my embedded theology and and when it's done really well I really like that I think you know somebody like Richard Rohr would say you know that that's a way to really connect to your soul Mm -hmm. Uh, for after hours uh, the folks are they're they're sort of at the last stop before they choose to chuck it all I mean there there's a a amalgam of people that are uh, we have some traditional church folks that do church, you know, regular church, regular in quotes, church on Sunday, and then they come to after us on Monday. But uh, the vast majority of them are uh, folks that are like welders and truck drivers and strippers and cops and folks that, that say, I never felt really comfortable, whether it was deliberate or not, I was sort of othered in the traditional church setting. And so I I, I want to come to something that, that focuses primarily on relationship and community. And so we only have a few beats to our service. We, we make food for the homeless, and that's sort of our service within a service. That's our, our call to worship. And then I talk for a few minutes, and then after 10 or 15 minutes, I throw to them and say, uh, you know, maybe he's full of crap. What do you guys think? <laughs> we talk at their tables. I, I, I have said more than once, I think the day of the usually uh, still to this day dominant, uh, you know, middle-aged white straight male guy talking at a crowd of people and saying, you know, sit down, shut up. You might learn something here. <laughs> I think that's over. I, yeah, I, I, yeah. I just don't know if that connects us 
to the holy in the same way that being in conversation and dialogue and watching people go, yeah, I struggle with that too. And having that back and forth uh, really brings up a lot more interesting uh, fruit, so to speak. And then at the end, we find out what the the high points of their week were and the low points, which I guess real church, traditional church would call um, joys and concerns. Then I say go home and then no one. So for us, those beats of being a better follower is, you know, how do we serve the people beyond this room? How do we try to learn something about God that maybe we didn't know before? And then how are we a community for each other? Not just the homeless out there, but the folks inside these four walls and really listen. We always start with a quote from Paul Tillich that says, um, the first duty of love is to listen. And it just kind of sets the mood to remind that this is an extra. This is like, this matters. And so listen, because people are sharing their heart. And, and that to me is, is church. And the fact that there's a community of people that want to do that, yeah. I thank God for every day. I mean, we, we lucked out there. Well, you said something on the very beginning of that that I want you to expand on. Yeah. And I think it's just simply because of the, the day and age that we live in. And I think one, I mean, you, you talked about later, like, you know, the white, uh, straight males standing up, you know, talking. I, I think the days are over. And I, th- I think you're right in a lot of aspects of that. And I think those who would identify under those categories, which that's me. I mean, I think we're waking up to that right. um, and it's a good thing to wake up to. Yeah. yeah. But you, but you said, you said centered on Jesus. And yeah. so, you know, as I scroll through Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or whatever, everybody is claiming Jesus in some degree, you know? And right. so from the far right to the far left are claiming yeah. Jesus. And so not getting political, um, but when you say right. Jesus, centered on Jesus, what what what's the what's the thing that you're thinking about in that context? I think that speaks a lot to, I think that reveals a lot about a community or a faith leader's uh, theology is just that one question mm-hmm. is to say, you know, who who you know who is God in our in our context? You know, who is Jesus? And to me, it, Jesus was the one that always chose to align with those on the margins. Jesus was always the one that said, you know, who, who is the powerless? Who are the people that, that don't have voice? Who are the ones that have shed all the tears, who have had their tongues ripped out? And, and who, who, who need friends? And I, I think our community has aligned with the homeless community specifically because, you know, they have in, in most communities been kicked to the curb. And so for us to, quote, be like Jesus has been to how is it that we align with uh, folks in that scenario. And there's tons of other categories of those. That's just one that rings true for this particular group of people. And how do we give them voice? How do we uh, be in community with them and not be there and go, all right, settle down. We're here to save you. Enjoy (laughs) your lunch. And no, no, we don't want to actually talk to you. Heaven forbid we learn your name. We'd rather just serve you and then feel good about how awesome we are. You know, I mean, we really try early on to, to make it really clear that that's not what yeah. we're about, that we almost always, and, and Brian, you're friends with me on Facebook and you, you could see the number of times when I leave the park, how often I'm posting about the gift they gave mm, me that day. Yeah. Oh, there goes Jerry again. Yep. Must be Tuesday. Jerry's got some kind of brag. He's crying over right. something. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, it's it's stunning to me how often they just, they bring me to tears. I mean, it it, it happens with ridiculous frequency. Mm. And and I think that's what happens, uh, at least my experience, when we're we're with the margin, people on the margins, the others, rather than, you know, do things to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think they, you know, they still benefit, they'd still get the sandwich. But I don't know if that's engaging with them the way uh, Christ would, and and we're about trying to be like that. Yeah, with after hours, you you have a couple different expressions. Um, so there's a group mm-hmm. that meets together for kind of like a more. I I mean, I guess it's a structured time. It's it's like sure. your equivalent of of a worship service. What most of us would sure. understand as yeah. a worship service. And then there's the aspect where you prepare sandwiches and then the next day you go out and you give those lunches to folks. Um, As folks are are showing up at your Monday night gathering, um, 
are they coming because they're looking for Jesus or are they looking for something else? We have a number of people that come to After Hours that would would identify, self-identify as agnostic, uh, some that would identify as atheist, um, a number that would identify as as Catholic. Okay. I mean, not even Christian. They, they've been Catholic their whole life. And while, you know, when you explain that to somebody early on, it's like, well, aren't Catholics Christian? Well, yeah, they are, but not not our flavor, but <laughs> sort of like it. But they, they believe the Pope's the top of the, you know, I mean, it gets a little convoluted. Yeah. But they definitely would also come there. And I, I, I think what people are searching for, and I tried to make this point, and I don't know if I was successful in in rogue saints is I think people are starving for a tribe and starving for connecting to something bigger than themselves. Now those two things can be done outside of a Christ centered community, but that's, that's what we're there for. We don't apologize. I think sometimes there's the, the assumption that, that we are going to get together and just drink beer and make sandwiches Mm -hmm. and, I would challenge uh, any church that I think we mention Wesley and Jesus uh, as much, if not more than most, because I, I think, I, you know, I'm, I'm probably a pretty crappy pastor in the sense that I'm not one of those guys that goes, you know, no, you have to believe that this is the only way and that this is the only guy. I, I'm not that, I'm not that guy. What I do say is, look, I've lived my life all my life early on as a Catholic. I left for 10 years. I didn't set foot in a church and I came back. And what I know is when I choose to follow this guy, my life is better. When I choose to, to, you know, look at that architecture or hang my hat on, on the, the person that was Jesus, uh, I tend to do better than if I go, nah, I'll just be a good guy. I'll just be, you know, being a good guy is good. Not for me. I mean, I, I slip pretty quick. It's like saying, yeah, you know what? You should, we should all work out. We should all be healthy. Yeah, we should. But I'm much better when I go, no, I'm going to get on the treadmill and get off at four miles. Like mm-hmm. I, I need that structure. I don't know if everybody does. I, and I think that's got to be one of the first things that the church is willing to say is that, look, I, I don't know if I'm going to want to shove this down your throat. Uh, but I will tell you that for me, this has worked. And, and yet I know some Buddhists that they live this amazingly compassionate, beautiful life. And who am I to tell them? Well, yeah, but that's, that's bullshit. That's not really the right way. The right way is my way. Mm. Um, I, I, think, I think that turns off more people than it brings in. And like at After Hours, a number of folks have said, look, the reason I like it here is, is one, I'm given permission to ask hard questions and I, I'm not shamed. And two, that I don't even need to get the answer, in quotes, the answer. I just need to find safe space to ask the question. And three, you're not going to you're not going to force that this is the only way. I I just don't think that has proven to be uh, productive. I I don't think that's that 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 track record has not worked for me. And, uh, you know, there's some very big churches that use fear in a great way and God bless them. But I don't think that's a that's a win in the long game. I think that's a that's a a win in, in short time. And so we try not to to use that method either. We've dropped Rogue Saints, the book, a couple times into this conversation. And in the book, you detail the accounts of a, of a bunch of people who you've come across who are expressing their faith in surprising ways. Really, kind of. I mean, people who are expressing their their Christian faith in some. Some surprising ways. You even mentioned that some of the folks who are participating in this would probably call themselves agnostic. Although, although what we're seeing in evidence is that they're Christians. So what, what makes somebody a Christian? In the way I define that might be different than, than some people. Sure. I think, um, uh, you know, so at the beginning of every chapter, I put out an open call on Facebook and said, look, if you connect to the holy, the sacred, the bigger than, in some way other than corporate worship, other than a traditional formatted structured thing, uh, then shoot me a a message and tell me what that thing is and we'll see. And I got a huge response and it was great. We ended up knocking it down to 
I think there's six chapters in the book, and I think there's six people. There's a few more than six. Some, mm. some lead off the chapters, and some are throughout the chapters. But what I didn't expect was that every single person that I profiled was a clergy person. Huh. So people that actually lead corporate worship, the thing that touches their soul in a very different way than corporate worship is this other activity that they have. And there was only one of the, of the people interviewed that wasn't clergy, and they were married to a clergy person. <laughs> and so I was like, huh, I did not see that coming because I didn't, I didn't select them based on that. I selected them on how varied are these activities yeah. that they connect to the sacred with. And, you know, uh, for me, I, I was very deliberate in saying these were things that connected them to something bigger than themselves and not say connected you to Jesus Christ or to this particular deity or this particular person that, that we that we choose to worship. I think there's there's a difference between being a faithful follower of Jesus Christ and I, I am I'm of the camp that look, you know, everybody gets their ticket punched, everybody's gonna get into heaven, so you can let that other thing go. And you don't have to worry about that. There's nothing you can do that's going to make God love you more. There's nothing you can do that's going to make God love you less. So, so go let let that piece go because grace covers that. So you're fine. But what is that thing that connects you when you're doing it? You're like, man, I'm not saying this is true for everybody, but when I go surfing, something happens. When, when I'm playing music, when I'm running, when I'm doing yoga or horseback riding, there is a specific thing that's different than when I do other act, even other activities I enjoy, but there's something about this that makes it special. And, and so I think that's, I'd put that in, in, in one bucket, but in the other bucket of what makes someone a Christian, I mean, for a long time, people were like, you know, you move into a neighborhood and they're like, you know, what do I need to know? Well, across the street of the Johnsons, good people, they go to church every Sunday, they're ex- they're huge Christians, you know, and that became sort of the defining factor. Oh, oh right. The measuring stick was, you know, how often you are at a certain place on a Sunday morning. Yeah. 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 You go to a certain place at a certain time at, at, on a certain day and listen to a certain person say certain things. And then you could check the box. It made you a good Christian. And while I think everybody gets their ticket punched and everybody goes to heaven, that's all fine. You can let go of the guilt of, of being good enough. And, you know, Brene Brown would call it hustling for your worthiness, you know, hustling for your worth. You can let that go. But the question of whether you want to call yourself a Christian, which means to me, I am going to try to live like this guy, not as easy. You don't get off the hook that easy. To me, you know, and after hours, I think this is even on our website somewhere. It's like, you know, following Jesus is, it's simple. It's just not easy. And too often we want to take the easy route and the easy route is you show up to a building you you don't have to do anything we've cre- we've created a consumer product you know peter rollins talks about church as crack house and i mean we've created this thing that you know come and get your fix and listen to the great music and the great words and you know you're going to you're going to feel better at least in the short term much like if you were to be on alcohol or drugs and and it'll it'll do it. But you're not really dealing with your problems. You're not really dealing with the heavy stuff because you're just sitting and listening nine times out of 10. Mm. And to deal with stuff, you have to share, you have to emote, you have to go through those those emotions. So I, I think to be a good Christian, you really have to be willing to make that connection. And I think that's simple, but it sure as hell ain't easy. I mean, it's, it's really hard to bear your soul. And, and to sit there and go, look, I am struggling. I mean, the, the, the number of people that are, you know, Brene Brown, again, would say, you know, we've, we've never been this in debt. We've never been this addicted. We've never been this overweight, you know. And yet, you know, we, we think we've got it all figured out. And I'm, I think we're starving for this connection to something bigger and this connection to other people. And, you know, not, not just Rogue Saints deals with that, but after hours as a community does as well. Those are, I think, our, our major points is that, that we want to be able to say we did at the end of the night. Yeah. You mentioned that like being a Christian is is living after or following after or trying to be like this guy, this guy being being Jesus, which I think is a, right. a wonderful working de- definition. Um, and I might even 
disagree with you, Jerry, is in saying that, well, people might argue with my definition. I think that's a pretty tough one to argue with. Um, no matter where you stand theologically. Well, that's like, I mean, that's yeah. the Wesley and, you know, we come out of, a, we, Ryan and myself, come out of a Methodist background. And, right. and so like Wesley is all about like, where's your, where's your soul pointed? It's not right. about crossing right. a line necessarily. Yep. And it's not about, you know, I mean, I would like, we, we would have different viewpoints on like salvation, but, but sure. in the, but, but as Wesley talks about, it, it's like, where's your soul pointed not right. are you in the box or outside of the box, and, right? Uh, right. That idea of using using your faith as a compass, exactly, exactly, point you in a certain direction. And you know, if it's if it's serving that purpose, then where you are on the path is not as important as yeah. the direction the path 100%. is going. Yeah. So, with that understanding of of kind of faith and your understanding of it, um, can you do faith without community? Can those things coexist? Yeah, I, I think I think you can. I think the Desert Fathers proved that. I think mm-hmm. there, you know, I think that there there are monks that are able to do those things. I just think it's harder. Mm-hmm. I just think it's like really, really hard. I think Jesus never said make sure. You, in fact, it's so funny. Even you know, we talk about after us being a faith community, and there's just so much baggage with the word church, and even the idea of gathering together. Like I don't even. It's hard to even come up with another name on our web page and stuff and other places we'll say you know we get together we gather mm-hmm. the idea of of saying we worship feels like there are so many churches across the country and world and there's no way to say this without it it possibly sounding insulting and I don't mean it to but that do something really really well that need not be done mm. and Jesus never said Make sure you get together, especially once a week, ideally on this day or this time. But actually, it doesn't even matter. Just make sure you get together and tell me how great I am. <laughs> Just continually tell me I'm awesome. Just treat me like your boyfriend, Jesus. Yeah. Like, yeah. just, man, you're the greatest God. You're, you're, you're the bestest Jesus ever. You're the most best Jesus. And I would do anything for you good because we we need some people to go to Haiti. Well, not that. I I only have so much vacation time. But anything (laughs) else I would do for you because you're the best. And I think Jesus goes, you know, I get it. But I I think, you know, if any of us had somebody constantly tell us how awesome we were, didn't do anything, we would start to question. And you and I sure as hell ain't Jesus. If we're bright enough to figure that out. (laughs) Don't we think that Jesus is smart enough to go, huh? You know, they, they talk about it all the time and they even get together in these like million dollar facilities and, and create this whole thing of different ways to tell me I'm awesome. But they stepped over a homeless guy yeah. to get. Well, I think, I think that's and, where, I think it's where you get all the pushback in, in our faith, um, sort of like history with the book of James, right? Yeah, I mean, I, for, for after hours people, I think in general, they know that what they're doing is is they're coming to a, a, a place to investigate their faith and to look into what it is that that you know they're struggling with or that they have questions for. Uh, but it's not; it, it's very, very laid back. It's not going to be one of these million dollar facilities. And quite frankly, uh, I think for a lot of them, that's the appeal. The appeal is that it's not, you know, it, actually, we were, you and I were talking before we. we uh, went on the air and you were talking about the guy that does the podcast that has one that, you know, is really quality. And then the other one where he just clicks on the mic and goes, <laughs> Yeah, I think we live in a time that people genuinely appreciate the authenticity over the polish, mm-hmm. you know, e- even, even when it's something like, Hey folks, guess what? The, the recorder turned off and we, you know, <laughs> yeah. You know, sorry, but that happened because I think people generally go, you know what? Yeah, that happens. Like that happens to me. And it's just, it's nice. I, I, I think there's a disconnect when we try to make anything too perfect. And I, you know, my background was as a performer and I think there's value in presenting a quality product. It gets a little dicey when the product is God, when the product mm. is Jesus who who came at this world with such an authenticity and a genuine desire to connect. It's a struggle when that is 
laid on top of, all right, make sure as soon as the, uh, the, the congregation stops applauding, you're already walking up to the mic because we don't want any dead air between the pastoral prayer and the Our Father. It, 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 yeah. You know, it's, I think I'm, you're I think you're hitting on two things there, Jerry. Why why things are going well out there? I think one, you're a pastor that's that's actually doing community with the community that right. that you're a part of. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, how many? I, I, I'm guilty of it myself in days. You know, but like, how often have we seen pastors who, man, they're leading incredibly, but they don't right. they don't know anyone, right? They know their they know their director of operations. They know right, they right. you know they know that guy right. girl, right. Um, but man, tell me somebody that's in the pews or in the seats or around you know, and so I say I, th- I think that is a, a huge thing regardless of however large or small or I mean I, I think that re- is regardless of the of the point the church mm-hmm. is or the community is is that hey we're actually we're gonna do it together and I'm gonna be in it so here's what's gonna happen if I'm gonna be in this with you you're gonna see my stuff too. Right, you're gonna Absolutely. you're gonna see my stuff, and and yep. the I mean, we being Jesus people, like we've centered on Him for us. He really didn't have stuff, you know. Like, right? <laughs> he's not, you know. He Paul, Paul said, Paul says, yeah. Paul says, I come with my weakness, you know. Jesus, Jesus' weakness isn't that, but what what Jesus does do is is man, he's around the table all the time. And he's right. breaking bread. And he had a hierarchy yes. of people. Like yes. the, he, was, he was fine being with kings and rulers and equally fine being with prostitutes and tax collectors and zealots. And yep. that's fresh and uh, really appealing, especially in our society now when we have managed to uh, quantify relationships. Like, okay, is this person worthy mm-hmm. of my time right now? I don't know. It, it, Jesus was really like, no, like everybody can come to this table. We'll all hang out. Right. And I really, you know, there's a great uh, Oscar Wilde quote that said, uh, every saint has a past, every sinner has a future. And I love the fact that it, it is a, a phrase that sort of levels the table. It's like, look, and I think Jesus was big at that. Jesus was really big at going, you know, you're all welcome, and let's share stories. Let's share stories. Let's do that. After hours, I'm sure we, I guess we could do it without food and drink, but I just think that sharing a meal cuts across virtually every time zone, That's right. every culture, and uh, and it, it, it creates a, it's just a great lubricant for helping break people open and get to a place that's deeper. Part of what makes any community, I mean, not just a spiritual community, but any community, what gives it identity is ritual. Uh, yep. So is is sharing that meal, is that part of your ritual of after hours? Is there sure. ritual to after hours? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think, uh, I think we've, 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 I've actually, a lot of discussion about this at after hours because I said, you know, I know we sort of pride ourselves as being these sort of rogues and rebels, this sort of island of misfit toys, and you know, we just kind of go to our own drummer and blow. I go, and that there's an element of that that's really true, and and there's no question. Having said that, there's also a part that goes, okay, let's try to do an after hours and have me start by going, yeah, you know what, this week, um. We're not going to make sandwiches. I'll just go and get like a foot long before I go down to the park. But we're just going <laughs> to we're just going to eliminate that part. Like it would it would hit the fan yeah. if I, and and they they wouldn't know why exactly. They're just like, well, that's what we do. And I'm like, okay, well, we'll make sandwiches. But tonight, I'm just not going to talk. We'll we'll just see how you guys are doing. They go, well, what do you, wait wait what what do you mean we're not going to? I didn't really prepare anything, and and uh, we're not going to have any conversation at all. We're just going to go straight to joys and concerns, and you know, our highs and lows. People would go. Well, what the hell? Like we came here to <laughs> learn. So I go, okay, you're right. You're right. Let's, let's have the conversation. Let's go ahead and make the sandwiches. But, uh, so I, I want to make sure I'm hearing this. So even in a community like after hours, like the ghost of church past still shows up and saying, we've always done it this way. Oh, Is that true? Without, and you know what? And it's, and it's unavoidable. Huh. If, if you look over your morning this morning, no one would say nobody broke out the Gloria Patri. At least I don't think so in your home, but you know what you got up? <laughs> And you did a thing yeah. and then you let the dog out and you did a thing. And then you, okay, do I turn on the shower and brush my teeth and then put on my contacts 
Or do I put on my contacts, brush my teeth, and then turn on the shower? Well, no, for me, I've turned on the shower and let the water heat up. And I, you know what I'm doing? That's my ritual. That's my morning yeah. ritual. And we can't avoid it. Now, I will say in nine years after ours has had prayer stations, and then we didn't. And then we had written prayer requests, and then we didn't. And then we had a final song that we all sang together, and then we didn't. And then we have music from my iPod. And then we did communion at every location. And then we stopped and only do it at one location. So I think the key is not to apologize for ritual, but to also say, does the are are we serving the ritual? Is the ritual serving us? Like, mm. is this still have meaning for us? That to me is um, like kind of a big deal. I think too often yeah. ritual becomes, well, that's just the way we've always done it. Yeah. And I think for folks, that may be the initial trigger when they go, this feels weird. But to really ask the question, well, why? And sometimes there's not a good reason. Yeah. And when I look at the changes that we've made, yeah, you know what? It worked at a particular time and place. It doesn't work anymore for us to do it that way. I think part of that is like what you're saying is there are things that we have always done, right? And there's things that that has come and gone. For me, when I hear those things, I think about our church context, our community context. Those things that never leave are a part of the DNA, and, and the yeah. vision of the community. And yeah. the things that come and go have been things that have brought up and brought to life part of those core things, and then they left. And we, yeah. we, we, we brought them up in a different way. Yes. And, and that's, I think... That's, great. that's an excellent way to put it. There's the DNA, and then there's the things that express the DNA. Yeah. And I don't think there's much of a problem with, with, ex, with, with, with having... Um, with changing the expressions of the DNA. It's when you mess with the DNA. Yeah. You know, I, I think it would be, you know, like I said, we've had a lot of changes, but if somebody came in, uh, you know, there's going to be a new pastor July 1st. And I think the reality is they're going to change things yeah. and, and they should, it will, it will work different for them than for, but I think at the core of the DNA, if they said, yeah, you know what? So uh, screw the homeless. Mm-hmm. We're not going to really do it. That's like, at the core of our DNA yep. is is to be with those folks who are on the street in that context. That would be messing with the DNA. To sit there and go, "Hey, are you guys cool if we make the sandwiches at the end?" And then do, I think people would go, "You know, yeah, we. I don't know if we've ever done it that way. Yeah, let's try that." Yeah, I think that's that's they're they're two very different things. I think you hit it right on the head. Yeah, you know, it sounds like with after hours that. The, the folks who come, like very few of them are looking for church, but they are looking for the things that, that we encounter in church, that even, dare I say, that, that church provides, you know, community and, and support. Do the folks at After Hours, do they know that they're a part of church? You know, I think they, uh, <laughs> I was, um, I had a conversation with one of the guys who's, uh, uh, one of our places is an Irish pub, and uh, <laughs> the guy um, came up to me because he heard about me moving mm. and I'm going to be in, in, a, in a new uh, location come July 1st. And I told him that the bishop appointed me and he's got this thick Irish broken. He's like, Jesus Christ, Jerry, what, do you, I, what do you mean your bishop reappointed? He goes, you got a bishop? <laughs> I didn't even know you had a bishop. He goes, I, I just thought you were, he goes, like, like you're a fuck, you got a, you got a collar, Jerry? You're a priest? <laughs> and I said, well, you know, I said, I'm, I'm clergy. I'm ordained. And so do the people that come know that we're a faith community? Absolutely. Apparently our landlord didn't know. (laughs) He literally said, he goes, I just thought you guys were doing great things. You know, I I didn't realize that it was like a formal thing, which was really a crack up. And and Alan is, I'm pretty certain, a hardcore Irish Catholic. And so, of course, to him, this looked nothing like Uh. church. You know, the, the, of course, this wasn't church. He knows what church is. You got to genuflect and cross yourself. Before yeah, you where's your robe? Uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, there was nothing that looked like that. But I would say the people, I think you phrased it well, I think the people that come are looking for what good churches do, and they are looking for that authentic connection where they can both connect to something bigger than themselves and connect to other people. I think that that connection is really the through part. And for After Hours, the way that we do that uh, in an intentional way is through is through service. And so for us, it's that, you know, those are the three, the three points um, 
that that we try to hit every time is you know how do we connect to something bigger how do we connect to each other and how do we connect in a way that provides service to the wider community and i i think as as far as guidelines that served us pretty well and i also believe after hours is much more it's a much younger community than i am it's it's probably 25 and probably 27 to 37 is probably the the sweet spot for after for 90 percent of the folks that come and i think in that age group there's a real sense of i i really need to be a part of it i really need to you know in the quadrilateral for for us Methodists, there there's that piece that's that's experience yeah. and they really need to see that there's experience attached you know to to the theology and to the scripture and to the ritual there there has to be that experience component and uh, I know for a lot of folks they wouldn't they don't wouldn't care if I was a ordained clergy or not and they they wouldn't care how well I knew the Bible they want to they want to know hey are you are you rolling up your sleeves mm-hmm. are you getting your hands dirty because that's what we want to do and I think that's where the value lies for a lot of them and to be able to have a place to share their life and the highs and lows you know well, you mentioned that your time at After Hours is kind of uh, drawing into a new phase or a different phase or yeah. or even – I I don't want to say that it's ending because um, we know that it doesn't necessarily work that way, but you right. are going to another church. You've been appointed to another church. Um, so any bold predictions about like what you're going to do up in Aspen? You know, I, I don't know if I would say bold pred- – I, I think if I'm – if I'm true to what I'm saying, if I'm actually living what I what I profess, it would not be to go into Aspen, which is where I'm going to be appointed. And uh, you know the optics couldn't look worse. You know, they, you know, uh, a pastor serving the poor on the streets moves to minister to millionaires. But but if I was going to any other church, is to go in and go, okay, here's what I know works. We feed the homeless, and that's the way we're going to do it. Because to me, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of, uh, of missional church over sort of an attractional church model. And I think with a missional church, you go into community and you say, where are your needs? Yeah, yeah what's what the need? Needs this community, not the one I've just done. What are the needs of this community? And, you know, for example, I didn't know this until within the last, you know, week or so, um, the... The Aspen area has, I think it's three, four, five times the number of suicides than the national average. Wow. And it's ragingly fascinating to sit there and think, really? This is a place where the median home price is $6 million. There's gorgeousness everywhere you look. The The town is as quaint as you could possibly have. What in the world? And so for me, it, it's worth examining saying, well, what are the... What are the services that are provided? And it's not just Aspen. It's actually the entire Rocky Mountains. Um, the top 10 states with the highest suicide rate are all in the Rocky Mountains except for Alaska. Huh. They even have, a, they even have a, a horrible nickname, but, you know, there's the Rust Belt and the Bible Belt. They, they call it the Suicide Belt. And they attribute it to the fact that there's lots of open plains. There's lots of isolation. Um, there's There's honestly and not to be political but there's really easy access to guns mm. and there's very little mental health care because the communities are so spread out so you've got no help you've got access to firearms you have isolation when you put it all together you go no i see that i see it so so it, it, that may not be the thing but that's one of the things i've recently seen that may change i also know that there are people craving community everywhere you go and I think I'm pretty good at doing uh, non-traditional uh, community. So there, there may be something brewing up there. We'll, we'll see how that all plays out. I've, I've got to you know, go in and, and sit down and shut up and, and listen to the community first before I make any grand schemes like that. So. Oh, yeah, no doubt. Well, I think, the, I think the takeaway for all of us at the end of the day and well, now at the end of the podcast is – is how do we enter our space and what we've learned from you today and thank you is is how do we enter our space and listen and, and just figure out what the common felt need is right and then respond to it right and so um and for us that center our lives on jesus we think those are jesus principles 
right. if you don't believe in Jesus, but still like the principles, you still got it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but yeah. I, there's a beauty in the idea. What, what is countercultural about Jesus is, you know, Jesus always ran towards the pain. That's right. Ignore my 1950s phone. <laughs> that thing is uh, awesome. Um, <laughs> For those listening, it's, it's a phone on a wall. <laughs> and there's a cord That's that a cord. can reach to the bathroom three bedrooms I do, I do down. I put a quarter in to make a call from my own house <laughs> every, every time I use it. So. Sometimes he picks it up and goes, 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 Wilma, will you connect me? Will you connect me? <laughs> right. Get me Barney down at the f- station. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. That's Nobody the, knows I'm talking about Andy Griffith right now. But yeah, I mean, it'll, it'll, it's, I, I, oh, for the love of God. The Holy I, Ghost. I, I love in. it. That's our probably, time, our time is up, people. Yeah. Our Jesus, time is oh, up. I need to, I need to grab that because Jesus waits for no one. So, uh, all right, Jerry, we're going to tell him where, to, where's your preferred place for that people get a hold of you online? Yeah, no, the, the best place is uh, they can sh- – I, w- I would say afterhoursdenver.org, but that, that may That's only changing. be up until the end of the month. My email is God doesn't suck at Gmail. So Amen. if anybody just, anybody just texts or shoots me an email to God doesn't suck at Gmail, uh, it'll go right to my iPhone. So Cool. Well, Jerry, thank you so much. We'll tell people how to get a hold of the book. It's not written just for church people. I think we need to throw that in there. Um, yeah, it's specifically not written for church yeah. people. <laughs> yeah. Complete with, it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we got to throw in the, the caveat that there's like drink recipes in it and all that stuff too. So. Yeah, there are. Yes. Yep. My years of bartending paying off. So. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us. This was great, Ryan. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate you guys. Thank Take you. Take care, man. Thanks. See you, brothers. Bye. Thanks, everybody, for joining us on this edition of the Compass Podcast. I want to thank Andrew Jensen and Dan McConnell for doing our technical stuff and Lane Denson, who makes sure that this podcast is released to the world at large. You can find the Compass Podcast at rethinkchurch.org slash podcast and through the social media platforms. My name is Ryan Dunn. I'm available through Twitter and Ryan is done. That's good. That's incredible. My name is Pierce Drake. You can find me at JPDII on Twitter or on Instagram. Hit me up. All right, we're done. <laughs>